Hey guys, my name is David. Welcome to Fearless TV. We're so excited you've joined us today. I know this message is going to impact you in such a powerful way. If you've been watching our previous messages or even today, you're just positively impacted or really moved by this message. We encourage you to share it with a friend. Put it on your Facebook, your Instagram story. We want to get the word out about what God is doing through Fearless here in LA. Or if you're saying, hey, how do I further partner with the mission of what Fearless is doing, what God is really doing through our church, in downtown LA, reaching these, these people who don't know Jesus, we have our Fearless Partnerships. It's basically just a group of people who are giving monthly, whether a part of our church or your state's away, and you're just saying, I want to sow into what God is doing. You can give monthly to the vision of Fearless. You can go to fearlessla.com, click on the giving link. There's a whole description in there. I encourage you to read about it, pray on it, and just be obedient to the voice of God as He speaks to you. Other than that, check out this amazing message from our pastor. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. I got, I got, I got, I got royalty, royalty, royalty. You know I'm a shot of the king, better watch how you speak to me Royalty runs through my DNA, God is my father and I am his protege I am protected by heaven, I'm destined and I have the tools for the victory Nothing you say can belittle me, I got the seal of the king and I'm living for you, cannot limit me I do not need your approval or accolades, keep your applause I'm seated right next to my God, my spirit and flesh are right eyes, but I'll never stop Earth is a home, it's an interlude, please let me introduce you to my dad Got on my side so I'm not holding back, I am not worried about the attack to 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 12. It's one, I have a lot of passages of scripture I love, but this is one of the ones I, I love a lot. And it's 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 12. Anyone have their Bibles or is that, you have your light, lit up Bibles? All right. Verse six, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory. Everyone say glory. glory. Displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure. Everyone say treasure. treasure. In jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from me. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Come on, that's pretty exciting already. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. This is Paul talking. He's saying, I'm going through it so that the life, there's a purpose. This is why. So the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body or our life. For we who are alive, is there anyone alive in here? are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, to trials for Jesus' sake, to suffering for Jesus' sake, to loss for Jesus' sake. So because there's a purpose in it, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us and problems and things are attacking me and they are at work in us every day but guess what life is at work inside of you come on that's if i just put the mic down the title of my sermon is power and the pressure when i thought of pressure i thought of pregnancy and I don't know if there's many of you that has been pregnant in this room or had children. Chris List, you have not. Anyone, anyone in this room been pregnant? Yeah, th we don't, there's some awesome moms. Come on, champion moms. We've given birth. Yes. Um, we, th th it's interesting. Pregnancy is, is interesting. I've had three children, and um, the cravings are, are really weird. I mean, I, I think pickle, pickles are normal, but it's just like normal things like, 
I just feel like I'm going to throw up, and then the next moment I want to eat just a, a batch of cookie dough. And maybe some of you are like, this is me every day. But this is like when I'm pregnant, I just like either, and you're either sick and then mood swings, and Jeremy doesn't know what to do with me because I'm either bawling my eyes out in fetal position over the dishes being in the sink, or then I'm laughing over something dumb, or then I'm just like, I'm just erratic. I'm just a weird person, and he's just like doesn't know what to do with me because I'm just like emotional and, 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 and the fun... There's something called the Kuvad syndrome, which is a, a fancy word for sympathy pains. And I found that Jeremy has sympathy pains with me during pregnancy. I didn't know what that was, but I would be like, honey, I- I'm having like mood swings. And the, the, what is going on? And he goes, that's so weird. I'm having mood swings too. I'm like, I'm, I'm craving this, this certain thing I've been craving. And he's like, I'm being, having cravings too. And, and the night I'm going to the bathroom all the time. And he's like, I am too. I'm like, what? who's having the baby here? I thought I was having the baby. Can you give me sympathy? Because I don't have time to give you sympathy. You're not having a baby. You know what I'm saying? So, so we would, we're trying to prepare and we would, um, you know, we watched this thing by, uh, Dr. Somebody, what was his name? I don't remember, but it was the five S's, the five ways to soothe your baby. And it was like, um, and then if you soothe it, then at the end of it, they're like a happy baby, you know, they're like smiling and stuff. And so we're like, we didn't have kids yet. So we're like, we want, you know, happy babies, right? We don't want, you know, to go in the loony bin because of kids. So help us to have a happy baby. So teach us, teach us. I made him sit down. He's like, I don't have time for this. I'm like, no, you do have time for this because you're going to help me with this child. So you need to sit down and learn this stuff, you know, sits down on the couch. And then he's like, you have to five S's, uh, uh, you have to shush it. You sway it, you swaddle it, uh, suck, um, slap. No, no, just just kidding. Uh, Then then they're supposed to be quiet. They're supposed to shut up. (laughs) I don't know if they shut up. They actually still cry. So we tried to sway. Jeremy would be like, like, swaddle, and and, and just none of it worked. So we were preparing. We were trying to do the five S's. And and I I just remember carrying this baby, and I was just like... uh, It it just got hard. I mean, at the end, y'all, a couple of moms know at the end there, and, and um, we didn't do Lama's class, we didn't do any of that breathing techniques, like how do, how do you breathe, and, and so like, it was very sudden with Lyric, um, my first, and so what happened was, I said, honey, uh, doctor, what do I do, how do I know uh, when the baby's supposed to come, like, he, when do I know when to push, he goes, you're gonna feel a lot of pressure, <laughs> I hope I'm not scaring anybody in this room that wants to have kids, but it is an awesome experience, uh, you're going to feel pressure. And I was like, what do you mean? And then I was like, oh my gosh, am I going to give birth to an elephant? This is like crazy. And so I felt so much pressure, but there was like 25 hours of labor. And I think with Lyric and then I had Lyric and then we had Brave. Uh, Brave was a little bit more stubborn and it was two hours I pushed with Brave and he was sunny side up inside of me. So it was just like crazy with Brave, but he came out two hours later and I remember, honey, you were like pushing with me. I was like pushing and he would be like, I'm like, honey, it doesn't help that you're pushing with me. He's like breaking out in a sweat. I'm like, I need you here. Don't pass out. You know, breathe, you breathe, you breathe. So we had Brave and um, they're both awesome and great. And then we had Arrow. And um, Arrow is my latest, five, almost six months old. And how many have met Arrow? She's awesome. She's the happiest, sweetest little baby. And um, she was, I thought she would like slip and slide out. They're like third one. It's going to be fast and easy. It's 28 hours of labor. The, her, she was the longest. Um, and, and so it was, it was kind of a, a crazy, painful up and down, emotional, hard, um, a lot of pressure, uh, different things like that in my pregnancy. And I found that uh, at the end, there, there's some, a picture I look at um, every day on my phone. I want you to put that picture up uh, of my family. And these are my three children. And they're beautiful. And I'm, I'm, I'm so blessed by them. And I'm looking across at all of you, and y'all are all smiling really big. Some of you are ooing and aahing because... This is a picture of joy, right? Yeah, is this a picture of of life? This is a picture of of joy. But I found that um, if I don't give up in the process, uh, I can actually give birth to a beautiful picture at the end. And I found that vision gives purpose to pain. Vision gives purpose to pain. 
There are many times that I felt like stopping in the process when I was pregnant because my feelings are fickle. I'm not feeling good or there's pains and there's hurts. But I knew on the other side was going to be a picture of joy and a picture of life. So I didn't want to abort the process. I didn't want to stop in the middle of the process, in the middle of, of holding this child because I knew at the end of it, the end would outweigh what I was walking through in the moment. Well, I was going to see at the end was going to be so much more worth the way that it would have been okay that I walked through some discomfort and some things that I walked through. I found that vision gives purpose to pain. I felt like I could walk through the miscarriage that I went through and the loss of a baby before Lyric came because I had a vision of God giving me children. I had a vision of being a mother. I found that I could get through broken relationships when I was young because I had a vision of having a husband and getting married to an incredible man. I knew God was going to give me somebody. I, I can get through the challenges and the hardships and the pressures of ministry because I see a picture of Los Angeles. Me and my husband see a picture of a city that is saved and that is turned upside down by the, by the love of Jesus and finding hope. Vision gives purpose to pain. I found that Jesus, because of the joy that was before him, he could endure the cross. One of the hardest, most, I don't even know how to comprehend something that, like that, that, that. The depth of the pain and the suffering emotionally and physically that he went through. But he said because of the joy, it wasn't about the pain in the moment. What he's saying is, is it wasn't about the moment. It was about the picture that he saw at the end. And it was a picture of, of, of a relationship that was unhindered, that was unlimited with his sons and daughters. And that picture got him through some of the hardest times. Vision gives purpose to pain. I found that, that many are enamored with the product. Many are caught up and enamored in the picture. Many want the stage, but they don't want the suffering. Many want the, the, the platform, but not many want the pain that comes along with it. Many people want to, is it okay if I I speak real with you today? Many people want to do what Jeremy and I do or say, I want the anointing that you guys carry, but you don't have any clue what we have gone through and the brokenness that we have gone through to get to this stage today. Listen, some of you will hold up a picture. And some of you are able to, even today, some of you are still going, I'm waiting for that. But you hold up a picture and, and, and people will applaud that. And people will, will, will praise that. And people will celebrate that. People want to ride on the coattails of what you've done. But they don't know the rejection. They don't know the hell that you had to walk through. They don't know the people that walked out. They don't know the loss that you went through. They don't know the crying, the tears that you had to cry in order to get that picture. And I'm telling you today, God doesn't waste a pain. He doesn't waste hurt. If you're crying today, if you're, if you've been crying tears, maybe silently, nobody knows they're watering the seeds of your dreams. They're watering the seeds of those things that God wants to do in your life. So guess what today? Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Put blinders on your eyes and keep going forward. God did not give us back plates of armor for a purpose because we are not designed to move backwards. We're designed to move forward in forward motion. Keep moving forward. Why? Because there's a picture to get to. There is a destiny that is in front of you. There is a purpose that God has for your life. There's greatness on the other side of that pain. There's greatness on the other side of that resistance. So keep going. He says, I'll give beauty for ashes I'll give joy in place of mourning I'll give you double for your trouble you don't have to quit here so guess what you're here today you should pat yourself on the back we should be having a party for you because you are here you should have been dead you should be strung out on drugs you should be in your house come on give yourself a hand clap come on go Vision gives purpose to pain. Paul said this, I'm hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. I have pressure on all sides. It's coming at me from every single 
angle. I mean, I'm not getting love from any, any, anywhere. Like how, how many have ever had it all happen? Everything's going good, but it's just like not one thing. It's like everything. It's like you lose your job. My kids went crazy. My husband went crazy. My, you know, relationships fall out. Everything you turn around. Sometimes when I'm preaching, I'll look on the right side. And, and if I'm not feeling anything, I'm not getting anything, I'll, I'll go to the middle and I'll be like, if I'm not getting any love, then I'll just kind of go to the left and I'll see if there's anybody like nodding. If there's somebody not nodding, then I'll just turn around and I'll look at Sarah Agbiani or Delisha and they'll give me a really weird look and then I'll start laughing. You know, <laughs> David's like, Paul's like, I'm not getting any love anywhere. It is like, I'm pressed on every single side, shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been in prison. I've been stoned. I'm starved to death. I'm naked. I mean, I am not getting any. I can't. Have you ever felt like I can't get a breath? I can't get above water right now. This is, this is how Paul is speaking but he's pressed, but how would he not be crushed by this? Wow. How is he not, how could he go through, he said he, he's running all the churches, and he says he's getting pressure from every church every single day. All this, all this craziness, how is he not taken out? He's still attending church, he's still going, running the churches, he's still being the leader he needs to be. Everything is, is, everything that could go bad goes bad, but in the worst way it could go bad. I found that pressure is relative. Um, when you were 15 and you experienced heartbreak, um, you really thought that that was going to be the end of your life. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. This pain is horrible. And you're, and you're like, I really thought I was like, it was the, I was like, dad, this is the end of the road for me. Like, like a breakup happened. But I found that pressure is relative. And sometimes we can minimize someone else's misery because we've graduated from a season. And people, we have to really encourage and, and have compassion and empathy for some people that are in a place that you used to be in when you were in 16 or 25 or even 30 years old. And you had somebody not like you back when you, you put that card yes or no and they said no. You know what I'm saying? They, they said no. Hey, we have to have compassion for people. And I found there's, there's pressure. Just the city we live in. Uh, how many have uh, always, how many moved here from a different state or a uh, different area? You didn't, you're not from Los Angeles. Yeah. How many felt like when you came even into this city, there was another layer of pressure that came? Um, pressure. I find that there's all kinds of pressure. I just begin to think of different things. For me, um, there's there, the, just the traffic alone will just give you just the pressure. I feel like I'm going to implode and then, and then add three kids in the back that are slapping each other. And then you feel like you want to, um, yeah, just drive off a cliff. No, I'm kidding. Don't write me. I'm not going to do that. Um, but I found that where there's so much pressure. So I, I, I have something called like I self-induced pressure. It's not really pressure that I should have. I just put it on myself. Um, men, many of you in this room, you're, you're going, I need a woman that is, uh, got good feet. I want a woman. I want to get married to a woman. She has to, she can't have too big feet. She can't have too small feet. And I don't want her toes to be too long and too short. I don't want the big toe to be bigger or, or, or shorter than the second toe. It has to be taller than the toe. And then I just really need her to smell like a garden of roses. And, and I need her to be five, five and three quarters height. I need her to have 10 inches of hair, not any shorter than that. And I want her to like dogs, particularly uh, chihuahua dogs. I want chihuahuas. If she doesn't like chihuahuas, I don't. She has to cook and clean for me and do my laundry. Listen, no wonder you guys aren't married yet. Come on. You're too picky. She doesn't exist. She doesn't exist. Women, I just all, I don't want anything big, God. I just want a millionaire. I want somebody that's going to buy me my car and, and a nice car and my mansion and my picket fence. And I just want a guy that's, that, 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 that's, a, a, that's got a lot of, um, you know, he's got a 10-pack. And I know that's impossible, but God with you, all things are possible. So they are, he's going to have a 10 pack and he's going to have a uh, flowing locks of hair. Like, you know, my husband's like, show him your, 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 your beautiful flowing Fabio hair. And, and he's going to have a beard and he's going to have the perfect amount of scruff and all and this. And then we go at 20, I'm going to meet that person 
And then um, at, at 22, uh, in, in February, uh, uh, the, I, God told me that month, it's going to be February. You know, that's a month of love, so I know it's going to happen in February. We're going to have our first child. And then the next child's going to come in December because I've always wanted a Christmas gift. And so God told me, to, you know, December, we're going to have the next child. And then the third child's supposed to come at 23. At 23 years of age, I'm going to have my third one. Actually, I'm going to have twins. I, I've, I've found that I'm in line for twins. So I'm, I'm supposed to be having twins and I'm excited about having twins. And then we're going to also get into an awesome big house. And then, and then at 25, we're going to buy that house and 26, we're going to have pigeons. And then we're going to have some cows and we're going to have a big farm and we're going to have five dogs, two cats, three pigs, and our, we're going to be an awesome, happy family. And guess what? None of it happened. Why? Because we put our plans in place of the one that should ultimately be giving us our plans. And we're trying to control our life. And we, tr we try to control something that he's meant to have control over. Then there is self-induced and self-inflicted pressure. Because now I had a timeline. And now I had dates. And now I had things that I thought were going to happen. And it's not happening. So now I'm mad at God. And now I'm disappointed. And now I'm tri figuring out how to play catch up. Because I feel behind in my life. Now the pressure is mounting. And now I'm trying to understand what God is trying to produce. But you can't understand what God is trying to produce in your life. You're, you're supposed to trust and surrender. And his job is the how and the when. Just that alone. I would write that, that was, that's hard for me. Your job is the trust and surrender. His job is the how and the when he's going to do. I found that there is pressure that is rooted in pride manifests itself in performance. Does anyone else struggle with performance, a performance spirit? Sometimes even this, this pulpit will walk out, will walk out, that would be actually a ma magical thing, will come out. And, and I, feel, I feel this pressure that comes on me. Well, God, where is that pressure coming? It's to perform. And and I, I remember, this was like a year ago, the Lord said, Christy, I'm not called you to be a performer. And, and that's all, I, all it was. I'm not called you to be a performer. And, and, and this pressure that we have, um, pressure to, to please, people pleasers, of you, pleasing others, pressure to, to make them happy, pressure to, to fit into someone else's standards for your life, pressure to... To, for someone else to accept you, pressure uh, to, to, to behave a certain way, pressure to succeed in this city and to make a pressure to make your family happy and proud of you because you made a move here and you're trying to make it. So you have a pressure that you have on yourself to succeed and it's not from the heart of God. You have pressure to look a certain way, girls. You have pressure to weigh a certain number on the scale. We have pressure, we have pressure and it is crushing. This pressure is crushing. I, I call it a pressure gap. The pressure that comes, this, it's this gap between who I think I should be and who I believe I really am. The pressure is between, it comes when I think I need to be something that I believe secretly that I am not. And what I do in that middle is I begin to perform. And that's a weighty thing. The pressure comes when you perform to a standard that is projected, that is not true to your purpose. That is pressure to perform now, and the root of that is pride. Because where is that coming from? The God? No, oh, that's coming from me. So I find this pressure. I, I've, I, have, I have this better, instead of being the best I could be, it's like this better than um, if I could be honest, better than, I have to be better than this person as a mom. I have to be better than, I look on Instagram, can, isn't it hard to not have a better than? I need to look at this mom. Oh my goodness, she made five meals a day and they were all homemade and they were in cookies at the end and then milkshakes and then the kids are all ha smiling happy at the table and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm a terrible mom. And there's pressure, be a better mom. I have to do better. Okay, I have to do better. Better, be a better wife. I, look what this wife did and I didn't do that for my husband. Be a better person in ministry. 
out, oh, look at that. But his wife in ministry, she's done this. She preached every single week. And no, Christy, are you doing enough? Are you new? Are you getting the picture, church? Are you catching this? I get the pressure, pressure in ministry as, as a wife and as, as a singer, as a vo- Oh, look at that person leading worship. She's perfect pitch, perfect everything. Look at me. I just, you know, I, I'm just like, ah. Uh. I mean, I remember um, a, a couple, like a, a couple months ago, I just had Arrow. And, and, and there was a bake sale at the school, and this bake sale is ridiculous. They want you to make dozens and dozens of things, but they don't just want you to make dozens of things. They don't want you to buy it from the store. They want you to make it homemade, and then they want you to set up a booth with props. I'm like, props? What kind of props? Like, what, do you, what prop do you want me to do? And the first year I was at the school, I was like, I didn't bring a prop. I didn't understand. And I went in the room, and I was like, oh. I bring in my cookies. I'm like so excited. I was like, I'm bringing in my homemade, had the kids, you know, and I look so dumb because all the, everyone had like spaceships. They had like an in and out sign with like burgers that were like made in from gummy bears and the lettuce was from a green gummy bear. I mean, it was crazy. And I was like, I'm a bad mom. I'm not a good enough. So this year I was like, okay, honey, I have to make props. Can you help me get the, the cutting board out? I need to get you, uh, um, can you go to Home Depot? I need you to get some things. What are you doing? I'm, going, I'm doing a bake sale. He goes, honey. And then I had an uh, arrow. I'm holding her and I'm sweating. And then the kids are screaming. And then I'm like stirring something and, and I'm trying to cook. He's like, stop. He's like, why aren't you just like buying something from the store? And, and, and I, got, I, I can't, I can't, and I can't do it. I have to, I have to do it. Like I have to be the best. I have to be better than I have to come in and be better. I want every mom to look at me and go, wow, look, she did this with three kids and she got in like 20 dozen cookies. Come on, somebody. She's the best. She, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I perform. It's like ingrained in me. Perform and I just have to, he has to help me go, honey, it's okay. Like you're, you, you know, I'm not supposed to be better than anyone. The only person I should be better than is the person I was yesterday. And that's it. And, and I find that I am trying and trying to perform to a standard that I have projected that is not from the heart of God. And, 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 and when we get released from that, which we will today, all of us will be, it is so relieving. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. So that pressure is not of God. He doesn't, he doesn't say, I put pressure on you. He says, I take that stuff, that yoke that you've put on you, that junk that you've put on you. I pull that stuff off so you can now rest in me. Isn't that good? Amen. Amen. So this is what the scripture says. I want to go to verse seven, verse seven. Oh, and I want to, before I get to verse seven, there's just a pressure too. Um, there is just pressure that a lot of those things are stuff that we've put kind of on ourselves, but then there's just pressure, um, that is outside of our control. Job transition, life transition, um, losing your job, um, pressure when it comes to your family, pressure in your marriage, pressure with, 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 with relationships, just anything, finances. You don't have the money all of a sudden. It, it comes, maybe you had a sickness um, surface in your life, in your life or your family's life, and now it's just life. Life is life, is life. and trouble comes to everyone's doorstep. It, you know, it doesn't matter who you are and how good you've been. Trouble comes. Listen to Paul. Paul's a good dude. He, he got saved, radically saved, going after God. And look at what he went through. He was persecuted. He was beaten and he was struck down. He was stoned. All these things happened to him. So you're going to have stuff visit your life. How many you had pain visit your life? How many you had unexpected loss, disappointment, discouragement? So, so we have those things. But I want to I camp on this really quick. And it's a verse 7. It says this. Paul says this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Who are the jars of clay? Yeah, everyone say us. Everyone say me. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show. Now, I have gotten this wrong because I think I've heard it wrong maybe some of my life. I thought this treasure was to show me off in a weird way, like my gifts. And I have all this gift and talent in my, inside of me that has yet to be seen by the world. And I can't wait to be a wonder woman and save the world with my awesome singing and my awesome gifts and talents. And they're going to change the world. Okay. So let's just read this, (laughs) but we have this treasure in me to show that this all surpassing power 
is from God and not, it doesn't have anything to do with me at the end of the day. I caught this. It was, I go, oh my goodness, this pressure has nothing to do with me. There's a reason behind this. God isn't trying to prevent the pressure. He's actually, because he could, but he is allowing the pressure for a reason. Because he wants to try to reveal his all-surpassing power that can only be proven when pressure is applied to your life. If there's no pressure, there's no accessibility to his power. If there's no pressure, there's no power. There's no pressure, there's no power. Because if it's perfect, I don't need his power. If it's great, why do I need his power? How will the world see anything great if I have a life that's good and I don't need him? He goes, I want a way to have a jar of clay or a treasure or your life to be able to show how great and mighty I am. So this pressure is not pointing to me. This pressure is trying to point to him upward y'all getting this today the bible says he won't give you more than you can bear that scripture is about temptation that's not about trials it's talking about temptation and 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 stress it's talking about we being tempted if you go back to that scripture it's not talking about this pressure because how many have experienced getting something in your life having something happen in your life that's more than you can handle more than you can bear And he does that so you realize you're not meant to bear it and that you can access the supply of the power and provision of God that has been available to you the whole time. So he goes, I put the right amount of pressure, just enough. Because if you can bear it, why do you need his power? So I'm putting the right amount of pressure on your life so you go, okay, that's it. I'm just, I relent. I'm going to need you, your power right now. And that's when he gives us access to, you don't have access to that power when things are going good. This is what I want you to get. It's power in the pressure. That's why he's allowing the pressure to happen in your life. You're confused because he wants to reveal to the world the power of his name. He wants to reveal to the world the light of his glory. There's two ways I have responded to pressure this is me just think of it as a jar of clay but it's a plastic awesome water bottle and pressure feel pressed on every side life hits us on all angles we are not getting a breath we aren't getting any kind of we can't get above water we, we're, we're trying to make it we're trying to keep moving forward but then we say, you know, everything happens. The family stuff happens. Sickness happens. Disappointment happens. Unexpected things in your marriage. Unexpected things in your family. And, and it feels like there's pressure coming at you at all sides. And you, you go, you know, I, I think I can handle this. I, I, I feel like I can save myself. I can, I can figure this out. I can, I can try to control this situation here. And I, I think I, I can fight this right here. I don't know if I can trust anyone. I don't know if I can trust God in this. It's pretty big, you know, so I, I'm going to just go on this alone. Maybe do this, do this. I don't need people. I don't Who needs people? Come on. Who needs people? We need people. Yes. But this person's going, who needs people? I don't need community. I, I, I'll just go and off and, and isolate myself and try to do this on my own and I'll figure this out. I'll work this out. I think I got enough. I've been through school and maybe I can outsmart this situation and I can just figure it out with my intellect or even all the stuff that I've been through. I don't think I could do it. And guess what? The pressure is crushing. It's crushing. The pressure is crushing. This has been me before. Have you been crushed? There's a, there's another way that you can handle pressure. Life throws some curveballs. <laughs> You find out some news that you didn't expect to hear from the doctor. You find out there's some issues with your your father, your mother. You're just hitting financial hardship. You're hitting 
marriage hardship. You're hitting all these different things, and the pressure is mounting. The pressure is so much you can't bear it. But then there's a moment that you kind of allow the pressure to cause you to look upwards. And in your trust and in your surrender, all of a sudden the power of God is released. The living water of God is released in this jar of clay called your life. And as you surrender, he begins to pressurize the system of your life. So now when he pressurizes it, says that you can go up to levels that you wouldn't normally be able to even breathe or exist or live like an airplane would be pressurized and now I can fly above higher than I could if I was outside of the plane. Now when I surrender, he pressurizes my life so now I can handle things that I normally wouldn't be able to handle. I can go through things and the enemy thought he was going to crush me, and but guess what? Somehow there's pressure on all sides, but somehow I can't be crushed. I, I've been persecuted, but somehow I'm not abandoned. I'm shut down, but somehow I'm not destroyed. Guess what? It's because I got his power. I've got his power. I should have lost my mind, but I've got his power. I should be dead, but I've got his power. I should be hopeless, but I've got his power. I shouldn't be in this room today, but somehow it was his power that kept me and sustained my life. And now you thought, devil, you were going to get me with that stuff. You thought you were going to hurt me with that sickness. You thought you were going to get me and take me out when that stuff happened in my family. Or when I got that bad report, well, think again. You're messing with the wrong girl. You're messing with the wrong guy. But guess, guess what? I have power. And that's something you can't have. Come on, give God some praise in this place. Maybe he had in mind the Garden of Gethsemane. Struck down, but not destroyed. Persecuted, but not abandoned. He was in the garden praying. And he, he actually prayed to a point where his capillaries broke. Have you, I, I don't know if anyone, I don't know anyone that's ever had such an intense amount of pressure to pray until blood is flowing outside from his head. And all of a sudden he says this in the pressure, Jesus in the garden. He says, not my will, but let yours be done. And in that moment of surrender, he turned pressure into power. And it was in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is the place of an olive press is what it means. And the world's greatest power came from the Savior's greatest pressure. The world's greatest power came from the Savior's greatest pressure. If you're under pressure today, he wants to release his power in that place of pressure. I want to read these scriptures and we're going to be done. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Come on, turn to your neighbor. And that's, a, that's a great line to declare. Tell them, therefore, do not lose heart. Don't, you don't have to say therefore. Just say don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Lose your hurt, but don't lose your heart. Lose your hurt, but don't lose your heart. You can't lose your heart in the midst of having hurt. Many of us keep our hurt and we've lost our heart. So we have no courage to step out again. We have no faith to take a risk again. We have nothing in our heart to want to love again and take, take a chance on love again or to, to believe that you could succeed again. So we have to have heart, but we don't need to keep our hurt. So I want you to not lose heart, Paul's saying. Though outwardly we are wasting away yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day what's inside of me is greater than what is coming at me from the outside what's inside of you today is more powerful than what is trying to come against you today that is something that you have to know then it goes in this verse 17 for our light and momentary troubles 
They're momentary. They are not permanent. They are not till they are not just they have an expiration date. That's what I, when, when they're momentary, that means there, there's an ending to some of this stuff that you're walking through. Isn't that good news for some of us today? God is going to get, let you have hold that, that, that picture that you see. He goes, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all of that stuff that you are facing today. My sister is a, a few years older than me and she got diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when she was 16. And rheumatoid arthritis is something that people that are elderly usually get. And my sister ended up getting it when she was in high school, um, a senior. And um, what it's done to her body is, you can put that picture on the screen, it's debilitated her body. This is just her hands, but it's, it's deforming. It deforms your body. It deforms your, your bones. And every single day of your life, you're in excruciating pain. Rheumatoid, there's some people that have different t- types of rheumatoid, uh, types of arthritis. But rheumatoid is one that is every part of your body. Some people have in their back or their legs or their feet. This is like head to toe. My sister got diagnosed. It was such a grim, dark diagnosis for our family just when we, she went through this. And I remember... Um, we just, we've done everything for my sister to me just getting up in the morning. I would brush her hair for her. I would get the blow dryer, dry her hair for her. Just things that I've taken for granted in my life. Um, she's had to ask for help. And what the cool thing is about my sister, she, as she got that, she wanted to be a nurse. And she goes, I'm not going to let this stop me from being a nurse. I'm going to go to school. And through being sick and debilitated, she went through all the way through college. And she became an RN and graduated with her nursing degree. Because she goes, I know I want to help people. And I have compassion for people who are hurting and people that are in need because of what I walked through. That in itself, what you're walking through is for someone. When God shows his glory, it's to help heal somebody else, help you're the answer to someone else's prayer, you know? And so my sister, I would open just as simple as, she's like, can you open this water bottle for me? We'd open, we, we, we'd go to, um, you know, Disney World and um, when we were young and we'd go on vacations with our family and um, almost every time we'd have to get a wheelchair for my sister and she'd be so embarrassed. She wouldn't want to walk, be in a wheelchair because she was just a young girl and, but she couldn't even walk. It was, she was crippled and she's been crippled and she's had so much pain. There's not one day that she goes through life and she doesn't feel any pain. She, she's gone through so much um, every single day of her life. And I call her and she's always so encouraging. And she, she just, I just talked to her um, just two days ago now. And she goes, Christy, Christy, I just want you to know that I've started a blog. And I, I've started a blog just so because I want to write about what God is doing in my life. And I, I just want to help people through my pain. I want to just help them find hope in the midst of what they're walking through. And I was like, that's awesome. She goes, you know what, Christy, I know that God is going to heal me. I know that God is going to heal me. I don't know when he's going to do it, but I know that God is going to heal me because I know God's given me books to write that I want to help people with. And I know God's given me a healing ministry that when I pray for people I see myself traveling all over the world and seeing people healed and seeing people get up out of wheelchairs and seeing people that couldn't jump and move begin to jump and move and I said yes Kay I know that God's going to do that I believe it with you and she's encouraging me she's giving me scriptures and what she's saying is guess what Christy I know I'm suffering in this moment but I know what's at the end of it is going to far outweigh what I'm walking through right now in my momentary troubles I know at the end of this thing it's going to be so worth it and guess what I'm telling you today maybe you've been crushed but now this way if you keep going you're going to be stronger you're going to have more faith you're going to be more steady you're going to be more faith filled you're going to be able to walk through the waters and you won't drown you're going to be able to walk through the flames and they will not you won't even smell like smoke that is the God that I serve so I'm here to tell you Guess what? You feel like this is the end of your life because of what you're walking through. But it is not the end. He brings his power in the pressure. Now I can stand in fires. I used to be crushed by them. I used to know I would be taken out. But now 
I'm still in the front row. I'm still here coming to church. I'm still worshiping. I'm still serving. But I'm going through the same thing. This is crazy. Because now I found that there's no power in me. Because it's not about me. It's about him trying to show himself inside of me now. So now you can squeeze in me. You can do whatever you want. Say what you want. Taunt me all you want. Lie to me all you want. Tell me I'm going to fail. Tell me I'm never going to. But guess what? I've got the power. There's power in the pressure. I've got the power. Anyone say, I've got the power. Come on, say, I've got the power. I've got the power. I've got, come on, can we lift our hands? Can we put our hands together and celebrate Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. There's some powerful people in this room. Thank you. Just lift up your hands. This, let's just surrender. We're just going to surrender.